Hi, I'm Ben Mankiewicz with Turner Classic Movies, and on behalf of our friends at Fathom Events and 20th Century Fox, I'd like to welcome you to this special screening of one of the all-time great sci-fi adventure films, 1968's Planet of the Apes. Typically, for a TCM big screen classic, I would continue to drone on for a few minutes about the history of the film, but instead, we have something special for you. I am joined by an original member of the cast of Planet of the Apes, a performer who doesn't do many interviews, preferring to let his work speak for itself, but we convinced him to join us, and it's a great honor for me to introduce from Planet of the Apes, Dr. Zayas. Hello, Ben. Nice to see you. Doctor, thank you for coming. I Everyone, appreciate everyone, where's my camera? Everyone watching, thank you for, it's, it's great to see that the old uh, films still get appreciated. Uh, doctor, how did you come to be cast in the film? Well, it's actually a very fascinating story, but this is neither the time nor the place. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, I was in a play, I was just an actor. I was in uh, With Six You Get Egg Roll at the Pasadena Playhouse with a very young Lindsay Wagner. Uh, and she, by the way, if you ever get a chance, mm -hmm. a delight, okay. a dear. And Artie Jacobs, Arthur P. Jacobs, approached me with this, he'd had this project, a uh, book by a French guy named Pierre Boulle called Planet of the Apes, and he said, I, th I think it would be perfect for you. Um, it, it seems logical that they would cast you in, in Planet of the Apes. It worked out well. It was, it was the, one might say it was the role I was born to play. Yeah, you might, you know? uh, yeah, you might, uh, you might say that. Now, Edward G. Robinson, uh, the human actor, yes. uh, originally was cast in the part, at least for a screen test. Yes, they did a makeup test, and this is, a, this is again a testament to Arthur P. Jacobs. Nobody wanted to make this movie. Everyone said no to this movie two and three times. Then he got Chuck Heston on board. And Chuck uh, was friends with, with Eddie Robinson. And he said, you'd be good for the heavy. They did the makeup test, and that convinced 20th Century Fox that the concept would work. It was called in the day a proof of concept. They, that convinced them that it would work. But Eddie um, had a bum ticker. Uh, and uh, he didn't think that he could uh, physically, it's a very arduous shoot, you know, it's, you know, you're shooting in the summer in the desert in leather. Um, they never think of actors. <laughs> you know, Eddie couldn't do it because of his heart, and, and then uh, Artie asked me, and I was, I was very happy that he did. There were a couple other Simeon actors uh, on the set? Yeah, uh, yes, Cornelius, who hadn't done a lot of uh, screen work. He was mostly a stunt rider. He was a good horseman. Uh, and uh, he would do a lot of things like Bonanza, Big Valley, in the background in a hat to kind of hide the fact that he was a chimp. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but he was good. I liked Cornelius a lot. He had a good working, uh, he was a ham and egger, mm -hmm. you know, Joe Lunchbox. Showed right. up, did his work, Get it done. went home. Yeah. yeah. Zira, on the other hand, Smith College, bip, 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 all day long with that one. Bip, 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 bip. It was, it was like working with Bella Abzug if she had an attitude. Uh, uh, Zero went to Smith? Yeah, Zero went to Smith. Huh. Uh, and, and you know how you would know within a minute of meeting her? Mm -hmm. She'd tell you. <laughs> <sighs> but I don't want to, you know, she's a, she's a, good, uh, she's a good friend. Uh, lives in New York, same building as Debbie Harry from Blondie. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. Um, now you mentioned uh, uh, Chuck Heston, Charlton Heston, yes. who played uh, who played the lead. Uh, a number uh, of other big stars uh, were considered uh, for this part. Marlon Brando. Uh, Marlon Brando. Uh, God bless him. But talk about bananas. Yes. That guy. Uh, Burt Lancaster also uh, uh, in, under consideration for for Heston's role. I, I don't want to talk ill of my friends, but I, I'll tell you, I am bidding on a very, very rare photograph of Burt Lancaster not talking about Burt Lancaster. <laughs> <laughs> that <Yeah>. guy. <laughs> I get it. Uh, so, uh, but you think they made the right choice, I guess, with Heston. Chuck was, uh, Chuck gets a bad rap uh, as an actor. Uh, he, cause he's a, he's, He's not an internal, quiet actor. He's not, you know, you're not going to get Michael Corleone in The Godfather 2. You're not going to get that performance out of Chuck. Chuck is, 
is a larger than life actor, but Chuck himself is larger than life. He was, I think he was like nine feet, 11 inches tall. He was, he was massive. Uh, he's a mountain of a man. And the first time I met him, I thought the Lincoln Memorial had got up and taken a walk around town. Uh, and the character required to be larger than life to carry that movie. And uh, I thought he did a, he did a marvelous uh, job. And, uh, uh, did exactly what was required and uh, got the movie made. If it wasn't for Charlton Heston, this movie would not have been made. That's that's an important thing that people don't uh, give him credit for. A lot of uh, dramatic scenes uh, between you uh, and Heston, moments of great tension in the film. Yes, and you have to realize uh, this was 1967. It was the height of the 60s. I'm very... Uh, uh, liberal, Charlton, a very conservative uh, man, and then so the tensions that we had were real offset as well. But in those days, you had your politics, and then you set it aside, and you were just people. Uh, and uh, he was a pro like that. He's like, he he was for Nixon. I I at the time was for uh, Eugene McCarthy, and we would be at each other's throats. And I would think I'm never going to talk to this again. And then in my trip. Now, end of the day, open the Charlton Heston. What? I made you an ambrosia salad. Oh, for God's sakes. Charlton oh. Heston brought you an ambrosia Charlton salad. Charlton Heston yeah. should wear a conical hat with half moons and stars on it because he is a wizard in the kitchen. <laughs> Uh, I heard, I was listening to a podcast, the uh, Dana Gould Hour. Oh, yeah, that uh, guy. Uh, I'm, bi I'm bidding on a rare photo of that guy not talking. Good luck. <laughs> uh, and I heard uh, there that uh, that Rod Serling wrote, uh, took an early pass at uh, Yes, at, at Rod, I did a, a Playhouse 90 that Rod wrote. I uh, almost did a Twilight Zone, but it was, uh, it conflicted with a have gun, will travel, couldn't do it. Uh, but I love Rod. Teeny tiny man, Rod. Is that right? 5'4". Mm -hmm. By candy standards, fun size. <laughs> uh, yeah, teeny tiny man, big talent, Rod. Uh, Rod was brought in to do the first pass on the script. At the time, in the book, the apes lived in a modern city. They had cars and airplanes and helicopters. And that is the script that Rod wrote. It was then rewritten by a man named Michael Wilson who wrote the script for Bridge on the River Kwai. And uh, Michael Wilson basically wrote the script that you see on the screen. But the architecture of the story, the breakdown of the scenes, the act structure, the scene structure, that's all Rod Serling's. And you can tell because the film really plays like a... It's really Twilight Zone, the movie. It's just a giant episode of Twilight Zone. Uh, in the same way... Uh, Smokey and the Bandit is just a big episode of moving on. <laughs> I was nuts for that. I had, did you get into that in the 70s? Convoy. I had a CB. I loved the whole truck. Oh, you thing. liked the whole trucker uh, talk? The whole, yeah. yeah, well, BJ and the Bear, that was originally a project. I don't want to get into that. I, I, I still don't talk to Glenn Larson because of how that went down. But I was the bear. That's what it was... It was B.J. and Zayas. I thought it would be better if instead of cross-country trucking, it, it uh, told the story of the downfall of man and apes' ascension to the top of the evolutionary chain. He wanted it to be about big rigs. Yeah, and it was like on ABC at 8 o'clock. Oh, it was, yeah, so, yeah, you know. Greg, Greg Evigan, nice yeah, guy. Yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, now has a little shop, uh, Greg Evigan, a little shop in Calabasas, restores uh, craftsman furniture. Good guy. <laughs> Uh, let's talk a little bit about makeup uh, before we go. John Chambers, who was, uh, uh, his character was played by uh, John Goodman in Argo. But yes, John Chambers, the, the makeup artist, good, uh, did uh, the makeup for, for a lot of the non-simians who yes. played apes in the film. Yes. He not only designed the makeup, but he had to engineer the style of makeup. And then he had to, he was a chemist. He had to design the foam rubber to make it, like it was all from scratch. It was a new kind of foam rubber appliance. It was a new way to apply the appliance. You could, they, the actors could sweat through those appliances. They were a porous foam rubber. He really was a one-stop shop. He was a brilliant man, very, uh, very underrated. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zayas. What, what a pleasure. It, what, was what really, a pleasure. it was great to talk to you. It was lovely to see you. When you come to California, mm -hmm. you must come up to the house 
and uh, we live right next to Tommy Smothers, and he has a little vineyard. Uh -huh. And I'm going to take you over there, and we're going to have we're going to have a good time. You, me, and Tommy, we're going to have some wine. We're going to play bocce. It's going to be great. That sounds like a that sounds like a great evening. Dr. Zayas, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Stick around. Dr. Zayas will be back after the movie. But right now, from 1968, also starring Roddy McDowell, Kim Hunter, and a scene stealing Maurice Evans. I I don't think those people are in the movie. They don't ring a bell. Here's Planet of the Apes. Such a great ending. Welcome back, everybody, and I'm here again with one of the performers who helped make it such a memorable film, Dr. Zayas himself. Doctor, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. You know, when I first saw that ending, I thought, oh, they have a Statue of Liberty, too. <laughs> and then, I, oh, no, it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, It's a pretty powerful ending, right? One of the that's most memorable a, endings a, in, in movies. That's a Rod Serling ending. I don't know if Rod actually wrote that ending. The, the theory is Artie Jacobs and Mort Abrams, who were the producer, were in a deli in New York, and they were trying to think of an ending of the movie, and when they walked out, there was a mural of the Statue of Liberty, and they looked at it, and they thought, that's that's our ending. Uh, this movie came out in 1968. Uh, since, first of all, there were four sequels to it. Of which yes, you I'm were, in. You know, I'm in the second sequel, uh, Beneath uh, the Planet of the Apes, uh, that stars uh, Jim Gregory. Yeah. Who don't buy a house from Jim Gregory? <laughs> is, that, is he a realtor? <laughs> no, we were friends until we went into escrow, and now we don't talk, and it's been 30 years. So. In addition to those four sequels, there's been a, a animated series. There was a, a network television series yes, uh, uh, in the 1970s. I, 70s, I had those action figures. Uh, yes. uh, and then uh, there was a reboot in 2001, the in Tim 2001, Burton. 2001, directed by uh, Tim Burton. And then the more successful uh, reboot later, 2011, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, with the... Uh, with Andy Serkis delivering such a powerful performance. It's amazing. And when I first heard about uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and they said that the apes are going to be motion capture and computers performed by humans, as a simian actor, I was furious. Sure, I bet. I, I mean, ima imagine uh, uh, you're on a, you know, you're on a planet of apes, and they're going to make the the Ben Mankiewicz story. And it's going to be played by an ape in a mocap suit while you're just sitting around Santa Barbara, you know, curating an Etsy shop. You know, I, I'm available. But I have to say, I saw the film and I was I was just blown away. I, I It was so great, uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and it totally restarted the franchise. And then the Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, I, I liked even more, and I'm not, uh, I'm not even in it. Uh, Dr. Zayas, uh, great stuff. Thank you very much. It, it really was my, it really was my pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much. And I love, I love this setup. You know what it reminds me of is uh, Merv Griffin. Yeah. I half expect Tony Fields and Mrs. Miller to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Zayas, again, been a pleasure. Thank you. I miss Merv. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Dana Gould and Andy Schoenberg for their invaluable assistance behind the scenes in making this interview with Dr. Zayas happen. And by the way, you can see more of the interview on our website, tcm.com. For now, though, we hope you've enjoyed this special screening of Planet of the Apes. Next month, the TCM Big Screen Classic Series puts you on double secret probation with National Lampoon's Animal House. To find out about that screening and others, go to fathomevents.com. For Turner Classic Movies, Fathom Events, and 20th Century Fox, I'm Ben Mankiewicz. See you next month.